Hello and welcome to What's in the Night Sky for February 2025. I'm Hayley and this month we are looking out for the bright planets, the Aristarchus crater on the moon, a close approach of the moon and Mars, the Seven Sisters open star cluster and our constellation of the month which is Taurus the Bull. Let's begin by taking a look at the planets. You can see here that I'm looking south just after sunset around half past six on the 1st of February and we've got the bright planets Saturn, Venus, Jupiter and Mars all in attendance. If we go around here towards the southwest and just take a look at this area where we have Venus and Saturn and also the crescent moon joining on the first as well. So if you have a chance to go out on the first, it would be quite nice to see these three objects close together in the night sky. And if we move in a little bit, put a binocular view on, you can see we also have Neptune over here. So this is a good opportunity to have a look at Neptune alongside Venus and the crescent moon. Neptune isn't visible to the naked eye, so you will need a pair of binoculars or a telescope to pick it out. If you do have a telescope, then we can take a closer look at some of these objects. We'll start with Saturn. Saturn is getting low now, so the beginning of February is a good opportunity to catch Saturn before it gets too low as we approach the end of the month. You can see with a telescope that its rings are appearing very thin at the moment, and that is because Saturn is approaching its ring plane crossing when the rings appear completely edge on to us and seem to disappear. And that will happen next month, but it will be too close to the sun by then. So this is a good chance to see these very thin rings before Saturn disappears into the glare of the sun for a while. If we now put our telescope on Venus... Venus is fantastic at the moment and I think Venus is probably my pick of the planets for this month um, because it's visible for quite a while after sunset. It's really super bright and it's showing this beautiful crescent phase and if you observe it throughout the month you can watch how that crescent phase changes and you can see that it's reducing its phase as we head towards the end of February. And you can follow it all month until you end up with a really, really thin crescent. So if you have a chance to get out multiple times, maybe with a sketchbook, you could have a go at sketching the phase of Venus over the course of February. If we zoom out again, you can see now that by the end of February, in fact, we've even gone into March, by at half past six, it's still not very dark. So we're wanting to go out later and later as the nights get lighter and lighter. Let's go back to the first. So we've had a look at Saturn, Venus, the Moon, Neptune. We also have Jupiter in Taurus. Jupiter's relatively high and bright throughout February, so the, the, the whole of February is a really good opportunity to observe Jupiter and Mars also over here in Gemini. Mars was at opposition last month and is still looking really, really good. So February is a great month for these bright planets. Saturn at the beginning of the month, Venus for the whole month, and Jupiter and Mars also for the whole of February. As always, we can watch the motion of the moon across the ecliptic over the course of the month and see it take a, a play a visit to some of the bright planets. So on the 1st, we've already said that the moon will be quite close to Venus and Saturn. If we keep going to the 5th, zoom in, we can see that the moon is quite close to Uranus. And Uranus, as we've talked about before, is too faint really to see with the naked eye. And you're going to want a telescope or a pair of binoculars to pick out Uranus. And if we keep going further still to the evening of the 6th, early morning of the 7th, then um, Jupiter and the Moon are close together in Taurus. And then on to the 9th. And on the 9th, the Moon makes a very close approach to Mars. If we have a look in a pair of binoculars, you can see they're really, really close together and this will be very interesting to observe. And although the moon does make a close approach to planets every month, it's not usually this close. Uh, and if you get your telescope on the moon or your camera, 
then you should be able to get close in enough that you can see some of this beautiful detail on the moon alongside Mars in the same field of view. So that's definitely one to look out for um, on the 9th of February. Let's stay with the moon and take a look at our moon watch target for February. Full moon this month occurs on the 12th and February's full moon is known as the snow moon because of the snow that falls at this time of year. You can see the moon is next to Leo the lion on the 12th and if I zoom in take a closer look and following our theme of looking at prominent lunar craters we're going to visit this month the 24 mile wide Aristarchus crater which I'm circling with my mouse now and although it doesn't look particularly massive it is the brightest feature on the near side of the moon and it's so brilliant because it was formed only around 450 million years ago making it one of the moon's youngest craters so in lunar terms 450 million years is very young uh, and it also stands out very well against the, the dark floor of the ocean of storms where it lives. You should be able to find it fairly easily with a pair of binoculars. It's so bright that astronomer Sir William Herschel, who discovered Uranus in 1781, mistook it for an erupting volcano. And he wasn't the only astronomer to make that mistake. So that we can take a closer look at it, I'm going to switch into my more detailed lunar software and we'll have a look at the area um, of Aristarchus itself and the area around Aristarchus as well. So here we are in Lunar Quick Map where we can take a more detailed look at the area around the Aristarchus crater. So I'm just going to zoom in on that area in the ocean of storms and you can see that we have Aristarchus here and it lies very close to another crater called Herodotus over here and these two are interesting to observe together because Herodotus is a very similar size to Aristarchus but it lacks the brightness and it also doesn't have the central peak that Aristarchus has. So if you are exploring with a telescope you might want to see if you can find that central peak and also have a look at the walls of the Aristarchus crater, these very well-formed terrace walls of the crater. You can compare that to the walls of Herodotus as well if you want to. While you're exploring this area with your telescope you might spot this long feature here which is known as Scrotus Valley. So it lies very nearby to uh, Aristarchus and is named after the German astronomer Johann Scrotter, who is thought to have coined the term Rill, which is German for groove, and is used to describe these long valleys or trenches that we find on the moon, which are thought to have been formed by collapsing lava tubes. And Scrotus Valley is the moon's longest example of a sinuous rill, um, one that winds around and resembles a, a winding river or a channel snaking across the surface. Um, and it begins 25 kilometres north of Herodotus uh, at a location that is sometimes uh, termed the cobra's head because of its resemblance to the snake and continues for 160 kilometres with a maximum depth of one kilometre. Um, they kind of remind me, if you imagine, I'll zoom out a little bit, if you could um, flip this area upside down, they, the Herodotus, Aristarchus and um, the Scrotus Valley, they remind me a little bit of a cat's face, um, the two eyes and the, the, the mouth of the cat. Um, I don't know if anybody else can see that or not, but that's what I always think of when I see this area of the moon. Um, this area of the moon is also frequently reported to experience what's known as transient lunar phenomena, which are strange, unexplained glows or discolorations or clouds or mists that appear and then disappear quickly on the moon. And it's not known what the cause of those um, transient events is. And the area around Aristarchus is one of the parts of the moon that is most commonly associated with these sorts of events. So if you are observing around um, this area, then look out for anything unusual um, that, that might appear while you're um, doing your observing session. Back to Stellarium and our constellation of the month, which is Taurus the Bull. 
And Taurus is a very prominent constellation and you may be able to find it on your own without using any pointer stars at all. If you are struggling to find it, then if you can find the familiar um, asterism of Orion's belt and follow the belt stars over here up and to the right and you come to Aldebaran, the angry eye of the bull in Taurus. And Taurus, the main feature in Taurus is the Hyades star cluster, which is this triangular shape that forms the bull's head. Aldebaran is not technically part of the cluster because it's much closer to us than the rest of the Hyades. You can sort of think of it as being a guest within the Hyades when you look at the face of the bull. Uh, the Hyades itself is the nearest open cluster to our solar system and it contains around 200 stars uh, nestled within the horns of the bull. So you can take a look at this area with your binoculars if you have a pair. Um, see how many stars that you can spot. We also have bright Jupiter in Taurus for uh, February, so you can certainly take a look at Jupiter around the same time. So the highlights of Taurus, the, the Hyades star cluster, Aldebaran, the angry eye of the bull, which is a red giant star, and the Pleiades open cluster, um, also known as the Seven Sisters. And we'll take a slightly closer look at the Pleiades. And these are, as I've said many times um, before, these uh, Pleiades are my favourite binocular object because they just look stunning in a pair of binoculars. And um, you should be able to see six stars visible to the naked eye uh, with good eyesight under a good sky and um, more with a pair of binoculars and even more with a telescope. Um, it's actually an open cluster of around 500 stars, all formed from the same cloud around 100 million years ago. And the seven brightest of those stars are named after the seven daughters of Atlas, which is why it's called the Seven Sisters, Atlas being the titan who holds up the sky. And the, the cluster itself looks like a little version of the Big Dipper um, when you uh, look at it with your naked eye or in a pair of binoculars. So zoom out again and put the constellation art on so that we can see Taurus depicted as a bull. And in Greek mythology, Taurus represents Zeus transforming himself into a white bull to win the affection of the princess Europa. Europa climbing onto the bull's back and he uh, swam with her across the Mediterranean to Crete. When you are looking at Aldebaran, the angry eye, see if you can spot its colour. So it should have a reddish or orangey hue. Um, and it's often described as the bull's angry eye glaring at Orion the hunter who's facing off um, with the bull uh, next to him in the sky. The Pioneer 10 probe is heading towards Aldebaran at the moment and will make its closest pass in about 2 million years uh, time. Taurus is also home to the famous Crab Nebula, or M1, um, being Messier 1, the first entry in Charles Messier's famous catalogue of deep sky objects. And to find the Crab Nebula, you can imagine um, an equilateral tri triangle with Betelgeuse, which is the red giant star in Orion, Aldebaran, the angry eye of the bull, and um, the Crab Nebula itself, which is over here, up by the bull's horns. Um, so one of the famous images in astronomy, there are lots of fabulous um, space telescope images of the Crab Nebula, and uh, Charles Messier, uh, labelling it as Messier 1, and he actually mistook it for Halley's Comet, and the mistake inspired him to create his uh, famous Messier catalogue, which is, was actually a catalogue of things that were not comets, so that he could avoid making that mistake again. But the uh, catalogue of objects itself is, is hugely interesting and a huge variation of different um, things that you can have a go at with a small telescope. Uh, the Crab Nebula is a supernova remnant, the remains of a massive star with a spinning neutron star known as a pulsar at its centre. Um, and was first observed in 1054 when astronomers in China described a guest star that was visible in the daytime sky for almost a month and eventually faded and then was rediscovered in 1731 by the astronomer John Bevis. Uh, 
And now is an ideal time for you to find the Crab Nebula with a small telescope um, by imagining that equilateral triangle with um, Betelgeuse and Aldebaran or better still if you have a telescope that has a go-to function then that might help you to find it a little bit more easily. That brings me to the end of our night sky tour for February 2025. I wish you clear skies for all of your observing this month.